Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Resilience Community of Interest session titled Healthcare Buildings and COVID-19 Design Strategy. I am Tamal Harbison with the SAME's national team, and I will be in the background today to help with any technical issues you may experience today. We do have a couple housekeeping rules. You are in a listen-only mode, but we also let you double-check your microphone and or telephone to see if you are muted. We ask that you submit any written questions for the presenter in the questions tab in your control panel. You may download today's presentation and as well as the PDA certificate in the handout section. And as well, today's session will be recorded. Um, and we will go on. Uh, we do have a quick poll that we want to give out. Um, so, let's see who's on the call today. Uh, who do you represent? The active military, civilian, and government agencies, small business, large business, or academic institution, nonprofit. And we're just going to allow just a few seconds to answer the question. Okay, and I'm going to close the poll now. And it looks like we have mostly small business at 48%, followed by large business at 25%, civilian and government agencies at 20%, 5% active military, and 2% academic institution or nonprofit. Now, with that, I would like to turn it over to our, to our moderator today, Jay Manny. You now have the digital floor. Thanks, Jamel. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Jay Manick. I am with CDM Smith, and I'm a member of the uh, Resilience Community of Interest. And on behalf of Joe Manis, I want to welcome everybody. We have over uh, 140 attendees. And I want to introduce uh, our speaker today. Doug Mass, uh, Doug is, a, uh, pres is the president of Cosentiti, an internationally recognized design and construction industry firm. Uh, he is a mechanical engineer and is committed to design innovation. And his work in the area of lead and sustainable design has involved design commissions from both corporate and government clients who, has sought, who have sought his assistance. Uh, under his direction, uh, his firm has engineered more than 100 projects that received lead certification. He's been uh, in this career field for over 35 years and has uh, pioneered designs of, of the first sustainable high-rise office building in Manhattan at four times square, the first league gold residential high-rise in the country uh, in Battery Park City in New York, and the second tallest building in the world at Shanghai Tower. And he has a couple of fun facts. He is a New Yorker, graduate of NYU, uh, School of Architecture, Brown, and uh, Brown University. He wrestled at 135 pound weight class, and he's probably not too far off that right now, still from uh, what I can tell about his photo. And he's an avid photographer. So, Doug, thank you for joining, uh, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Well, thank you. Can everybody hear me? That's number one. Uh, I want to make sure that it's, it's um, people can hear me. And can you see my screen? And once you do, I'll get started. Yes, we can. We can see you and hear you. Great. Well, anyway, uh, thank you for the privilege to present to this uh, to this group, and uh, I'm actually very excited about about this today. Uh, just to give you an idea, by the way, I no longer weigh 135 pounds. You had to go into the showers with rubber suits back in those days to lose weight. Today, you would you'd be arrested to do that because it's uh, it'd kill you. So I no longer weigh 135. Uh, not anywhere near it. So let me just talk a little bit about. Just go to the next slide. Uh, let me tell you about who we are, and many of you certainly know TetraTech as uh, as one of the leading environmental firms in the world. And within TetraTech, there's a high performance building group, and we design buildings throughout the world. I say we design everything within the building, and TetraTech does everything outside the building. Uh, the other units, we have 2,500 uh, design experts uh, in, in 30 offices worldwide on four continents. 
And for the presentation today, just a little context, back in March where all of us were obviously in shock as to what the heck is going on, uh, we started getting calls. What do I do? You know, what's going on with this virus? Uh, and you know, do I put filters in my building? And everybody started coming out of the woodwork with ideas. And, and I said, you know, this is a lot bigger than me and my unit, Cosentini. This is global. So we said, we'll set up a, a task force. And the task force includes not only my office and many of the folks in my office, but our West Coast folks, Glumac, our Asian uh, and Australian group, Norma Disney Young. And then we went to the next step after listening to Dr. Fauci. I said, this is about science. We're very fortunate to have on our task force Dr. Bill Banfleth, who's a professor at Penn State, he is the chairman of the ASHRAE COVID-19 Task Force. Dr. Michael Kaiser, who is an MD and a specialist in infectious diseases. So we have a pretty robust group who's contributed to this. So the first thing I wanna say is, we put a disclaimer because every day things change. As we know, we read new articles, there's new research. This is six to eight months old, and we're not talking about something that's been studied for years. So there are things that we're gonna tell you today that, that, you, that may change tomorrow. Uh, for those of you who are architects and engineers and want to get your uh, continuing education points, because clearly we're stuck at home, many of us, uh, we're going to send a link for you. And I'm supposed to put these two slides up and just basically say that this is registered with the AIA. And, uh, you know, we'll give you the information to get your credit. So let's talk about where we are today. SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the virus that causes COVID-19. So there are two different things. One's an illness and one is a virus. And this is the key sentence. It's primarily transmitted through respiratory droplets greater than five microns. Other modes of transmission may include aerosols less than my five microns and touching contaminated surfaces, although this is not thought to be the main way the virus spreads. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. So we as an industry need to rethink of how we design buildings with a focus on healthy buildings. So we're gonna talk about how do we respond as design professionals and operational professionals and leadership to the buildings. And how do we make sure that the community that enters buildings are as safe as possible? So we've divided this presentation into four basic parts, uh, awareness of the virus and the illness, physical design concepts that we can consider to put into the buildings that we occupy, operational concepts, as well as how do we influence safe social behavior. So as I, I mentioned early on, we update this Every day, we have a full-time researcher on our staff, as well as our, our uh, um, uh, science-based partners. And you know, what I've always found intriguing that, uh, you know, unfortunately, there's over 22 million uh, confirmed cases today, and they, they, they claim that that's probably a tenth of the actual number of cases. We all know someone that had all the symptoms, but it was early on, they couldn't get a test. And I remember practicing in China, in fact, uh, uh, this is before we did the Shanghai Tower, uh, when the SARS virus hit, and we were all very, very concerned about coming in out of China. 8,000 cases, 22 million, just give you an idea. The virus itself obviously is a very small particle. It's in the range of 60 to 140 nanometers. The flu virus is about 100, rhinovirus is the common cold. You can see the size and of course, context of how big it is compared to a human hair. So let's talk about transmission. A lot of controversy, a lot of uh, of, of, um, of information and everything we have is footnoted. So if you want, you know, later on, we'll be distributing this. If you have more questions, you can always ask me. The primary transmission method is believed to be respiratory droplets greater than five microns that will fall out of the sky. That's how the six foot or two meter uh, dimension came up to stay away. And aerosolized droplets, if you think about it, as the droplet gets smaller, it's, let's say it starts evaporating, it becomes buoyant. In other words, the force of gravity uh, is, is such that it's so light that just the buoyancy, the air motion will keep it, it, keep it floating in the air. And that's a concern that what if I'm further than six feet away? And especially in the winter time, what's gonna happen? And that's, that's of, of a concern. Again, surfaces, fomite transmission, what they do live on surfaces, the virus has been known to live. It's very weak with soap and water, you can get rid of it very little evidence of any that people have gotten it from touching surfaces, but we should be very vigilant and keep our hands clean. Transmission, the four major things to consider. And I talked to my kids about this. I, I just had lunch with a, with a client and we talked about this. I said, the four things we all need to be vigilant about is one, keeping our distance and wearing a face mask. Two, be in an outdoor or a well-ventilated environment. 
Try to avoid small rooms. Try to avoid public gathering spaces if you can. Third is limit the time that you're with somebody. And of course, activity level. Uh, we've seen the studies on singing, yelling, et cetera. There's more droplets. So just if you, if you, if we all think about this, it will keep us safer. So let's talk about transmission. And this first sentence is why we're on this call today. And it's those infected with the virus are emitting the virus before they are symptomatic. So they have no symptoms and they're out there spreading the virus. Uh, and sometimes if, if people get tested, some of the testing is not even picked up. There's a lot of false, false negatives. And the real concern is that starting about two and a half days before you have any symptoms, you start spreading the virus. 18 hours, they claim, is the maximum, your maximum contagious at 18 hours. And they are estimating about 44% of the transmissions that people have gotten sick from people who do not have the symptoms, the pre-symptomatic uh, symptoms. So, you know, we have to be very careful. That's why we wear masks and we're trying to be, stay away from, from people and not too close. Next is what we call the infectious dose. How much virus do you need to inhale or take into your body to make you sick? And of course, there's no known answer to that, but it could range, they're saying, from a few hundred to thousands of, of particles. But what we do know is that we want to be keep ourselves in a lower infectivity uh, space versus a higher infectivity space. So for example, someone who's breathing, there's droplets that come out of, of your mouth. And based on actually uh, studies that were done for the flu virus, they're saying just the, 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 uh, the droplets that come out from breathing could have 33 infectious particles. Yet if you're very sick and you cough or sneeze because the air is coming from deep in the lungs where the virus tends to accumulate, you could have millions of infectious particles. So the answer is to try to you know, really be careful of the activity level that you're doing and the time you spend with people. So what is ASHRAE's position? Because we want to go back to science. And ASHRAE is saying, look, we do know that the, that the viruses can be airborne. Uh, they, they can become a vapor, think of it as a fog. Uh, and it can get into an HVAC system. So they're saying is ventilation and filtration provided by the HVAC systems can reduce the airborne concentration of the virus and thus the risk of transmission through the air. So one thing that's very important is no matter what we do to a ventilation system and a filtration system, it will not prevent person-to-person -person transmission. So all we could do is be as, as, uh, as safe and conservative as we can in our designs. So now we'll talk about the physical environmental design concept. We'll talk about HVAC, we'll talk about architectural concepts, materials, and then how technology can help foster safer environments in a building. So let's talk about the HVAC systems. And this is obviously the area where mechanical engineers and Cosentini and technology engineers. So we talked about the infectious dose. You think about that. We talked about the number of viruses that people will, will, will um, exhale. Uh, so that what you want to do is number one, you want to dilute the virus. How do you dilute the virus? By bringing in more outside air or having a meeting outdoors. So how do you dilute it? So in a building, we want to increase outdoor air ventilation. If we have demand control ventilation in a building, and I'll describe what that is, you, you want to disable it. Demand control ventilation is an energy conserving system, which is very logical. It says, if you have less people in the building, you should bring less outside air in because the way we've designed buildings in the past is the amount of outside air you bring in is based on the number of people in the activity. And we have carbon dioxide sensors to save energy. We're saying now during this pandemic, until there's a vaccine and we've gone through this, let's disable the demand control ventilation so we maximize the amount of, of outside air you bring in. Extend the hours of operation and consider pre and post occupancy purge. We're suggesting two hours before and two hours after occupancy, that the system is bringing in outside air to dilute what might be in the air. And in very small spaces, uh, like conference rooms, et cetera, especially in a new project, we're asking to put CO2 sensors in, which as they detect CO2 levels going up, will bring in more outside air in the system. So now we've diluted the contaminants. The next thing is we want to remove it, okay? And how do you remove a contaminant? If it gets back to the air handling system, you put in good filters. And there's different types of filters we'll go through. We're talking about enhanced filtration. Uh, we're saying, a MERV, ASHRAE is saying MERV 13. We're suggesting 14 or better. 
And then you can disable contaminants. There's systems that can disable what's in the air, uh, 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 the contaminants in the air through ionization, which we'll talk about, and UV light sanitation, which is very, very well studied and, and a proven technology. We'll talk about air exchange, recirculation of zones. The smaller the zone, the less chance of, of a virus going from one person to another, increasing bathroom exhaust, elevator ventilation, keep air motion in elevators, and of course, pressurization relationships between spaces, especially residential. Humidification can help limit people getting sick uh, and transmission because our immune system is, is more robust when it's in a 40 to 60% RH situation. So let's talk about air changes in a building. And this is an important slide and, and I'll, I'll simplify it. A modern building today, if you follow the ASHRAE codes and you bring in about 0.15 CFM per square foot, it takes one hour to completely change the air. That means that you bring in 100% of the outside air in a 60 minute period. But it goes back to the air handling unit, it's recirculated six times an hour. So think about it, the air goes back and forth to the air handling unit continuously being filtered six times, but you're only bringing in fresh air completely once an hour. If you double the outside air, obviously it's every 30 minutes or two air changes per hour. And we've also done an analysis for, you know, if you take the ceilings out, you have a taller ceiling and what those numbers would be. And there's induction buildings, a different style of buildings in the major cities that have uh, different numbers. But the, the bottom line is filters are very important. And you say, what about energy use? And we've done an analysis actually of two buildings um, in, in, in one of the large cities. Bottom line is if you double the outside air, if you can, if your air link systems can handle it, uh, you could get up to a 20% energy usage increase, a member of the HVAC energy, and just de uh, disabling demand control ventilation, about a 5% energy use increase. So let's talk about that. First, we've diluted. Now we'll talk about removal. We'll talk about filters, ionization, UV, and carbon, with, again, a disclaimer at the bottom that due to the nature of the virus, HVAC solutions are not effective in preventing the spread from person to person or eliminating airborne risk. They will work in their area of influence. And that's very important. I don't want anybody to think, and I've had this question, oh, if I put a good system in, do I tell my, my employees or the, or the tenants not to wear masks? The answer is no. So let's talk about how a filter works, whether it's a HEPA filter, which we'll talk about, or a standard filter. A filter is really a, a bunch of glass fibers or fibers, fibrous materials that are meshed together that capture particles. So you could have large particles are caught Smaller particles may be a little more active. And what you'll see, we're gonna talk a little bit about diffusion. And, and the reason I bring this up is you'll see on, on one of the slides that you would assume the denser the filter, the more it captures, which is true. But when you get very, very small particles, there's something called the Brownian motion. I'm sure many of you know better than me because uh, I haven't studied that since college, is something is so light, it becomes uh, so so erratic the way it flows that that the particles have a very, very um, uh, uh, diffuse pass, passage and the smaller particles can get caught. Whereas an intercepted particle, a heavier particle might get right through. So let's talk about filters. Again, ash rate charts. Filters are rated by what they're trying to capture. And the standard ash rate charts talk about a few things. There's MERV ratings and everybody knows what MERV is today. You can go from MERV 8 to MERV 20 filters. And then ash rate rates them on what they're trying to capture three to 10 micron particles, one to three, and it goes down to 0.3 to one. Now, if you remembered, I talked about the virus being around 100 nanometers or 0.1 micron, and you might say, whoa, you know, it's, this, this is being rated at 0.3, the virus is much smaller. You said it's 0.1. Well, let's we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, filters less than MERV-13 do not have a measurable quantity of small particles that they remove. So a fan coil unit, a, a, a VRF unit, smaller uh, uh, incremental units may not have good filters. An air handling unit, should, um, typically floor by floor units, large units can handle with MERV-13 and work because remember, the denser the filters, the higher the pressure drop. So we're recommending, and ASHRAE is recommending a minimum of 13. We like to see a 14. We don't think it's a heavy lift from a pressure drop to go from a 13 to 14. It does have a minimum capture rate. HEPA filters, the high efficiency particulate filters are used in hospitals, and those are the ones in blue here. And you might say, well, why shouldn't we go as high as we can? And I'll show you. 
This is a chart that shows predicted risk, risk of infections from the flu virus. Again, they feel that the SARS virus mimics the flu virus and its behavior, that the risks of, the, of getting sick from the flu virus versus the filters you put in. And what you notice is that at no filters are saying the flu virus, and this is in an office space, um, a hypothetical office space, 25% risk of infection with no filters. And as you see, the filter gets better and better. It, the curve starts to flatten at a MERV 13. And a 14 and a 15, if you notice, the risk of infectivity statistically does not go down. The reason is the 13 captures enough of the very small uh, the, uh, the flu viruses. And there's really no need to go beyond this. This chart on the right talks about the cost. And as you can see, MERV 13, MERV 14 are about the same. MERV 15 is a little more expensive. And when you get into a, a HEPA filter, between the pressure drop and the cost, you're spending a lot more money, yet you're not getting that much of a reduction in, in the infectivity. Let's talk about uh, other types of filters. There's an electronic filter. An electronic filter is you charge the plates, and the plates attract the particles, and they stick to the plates. Again, for this particular virus, uh, we're not recommending this type of filter uh, because you're at the subject of, of uh, power. And if power goes out or even to a section, the air will go right through. But it's something that is they're very efficient and they have a very low pressure drop, not something we typically use in commercial applications. Now we'll talk about ionization. Many of you, I'm sure, have heard about it. There's a lot of information about it. But bipolar ionization basically takes the oxygen, and the moisture in the air and creates positive and negative ions. And those ions attach themselves to particles in the air, including viruses. This is a sort of an illustration of a coronavirus. Corona uh, is because of the crown. These look like little crowns. And they attach themselves. And what the manufacturers are telling us of these ionization systems is that their research says that it attaches itself to a protein shell of the viruses and can disable the virus. Now, ASHRAE's position is very clear. It says systems are reported to range from ineffective to very effective in reducing airborne particulates and acute health symptoms. However, convincingly, uh, scientific rigorous peer review studies do not exist currently. And we have to be careful what the manufacturers are telling us. Basically, there's a lot of studies out there. I've read at least six. Five of the six were sponsored by the manufacturers. And they talk about viruses on surfaces. Uh, they're not talking about airborne viruses. So it's, again, it's a system that's out there, not something that we're recommending for viral control. We think it happens to be a good system just for generally cleaning the air for allergies, but it's something that you'll see a lot of information on it. Some of our clients are using it throughout, and some of them uh, are not. Uh, how you would install a system like this to be retrofitted, it's uh, generally you could put it on the inlet to a uh, filter or a coil where the particles will clump together because they all attach themselves uh, through the positive and negative ions and they can get caught in the filters or you can put it on the discharge of the unit and they look like fluorescent tubes. This particular style uh, is a dielectric. Uh, they have other styles and it, it puts the air ions into the air, into the space. Now I'll talk about UV. UV is a known method of killing, disabling viruses and other other um, uh, airborne particles. Uh, UV has been used for over 100 years, actually, in the water industry. Many of you may be involved in the water industry, and you know a lot of the uh, of the water treatment plants do use uh, UV. the The most germicidal wavelength is in UVC of 265. There's something called far UVC, which is at the lower end of the of the UVC spectrum, and you can go up to an indigo light, which we'll talk about. The bottom line is the way UV works is very simple. It has to do with the dose. The dose or how long a virus or any other living material is exposed to the virus times the intensity of the light. So for an HVAC system, we have ducts that run and we blow air at a very high velocity. And, and the effectiveness is based on how long the air is exposed and, and the dosage. So for example, in healthcare, in the healthcare industry, here's an illustration. This is a cooling coil and you could see the lights. And these are the UV lights. And we've been using these, our industry in, in, in the healthcare industry for a long time because cooling coils are always wet. They dehumidify and there's a lot of moisture on them and it prevents 
the growth of molds and spores, et cetera. And if you select these, uh, the lights at, at the right intensity, maybe uh, uh, 1250 uh, um, uh, microwatts, you know, we're, we're looking at that today, it can be effective in reducing any kind of airborne uh, viruses that go through. But it has to, you have to have the resonance time. In a standard, let's say 150 microwatt unit, you might need six to 10 seconds if you're running in the duct. The duct may be 1,500 feet per minute. A coil is a much lower velocity, under 500 feet per minute. So again, it's something that you can consider. We're putting it in some buildings, but it has to be retrofitted. That's the UVC lights. Another application is called upper room UV disinfection. Very effective, and it's used in the healthcare industry, uh, TB clinics, et cetera. And when you think about it, it makes sense. The lights shine up, and the velocity across the ceiling is very, very low. And there's some convection. So this is sort of an illustration. This person is sick, and just general convection, the viruses go up in the ceiling, and they sit at a very, very low velocity. Just something to think about. Healthcare industry. You've probably seen this on, uh, on actually 60 Minutes three months ago, had an expose on, on uh, this technology uh, with Amazon in their Whole Foods uh, stores. And they had one of these robotic units that will travel through the, through the store. Again, UV is only effective when the surface is exposed. So if behind this monitor, if, if this unit is not moved, the back of the monitor would not be disinfected. And if you look at the time that Things need to be exposed. Again, you have to know what it is you're trying to kill. These are very expensive units. They're robotics. There's a, a pulse xenon lamp technology. There's different technologies that are out there today that people are using. Now, let's get to more of a practical application. How do we apply this into office space or space in the future that you're going to be working in? Well, there's something called UVC lights on occupancy sensors. So one of the thoughts is, what if you put lighting in the office with an occupancy sensor? When people are not there, the light goes on, it will disinfect surfaces. Again, something that can be done, but if you're sitting there all day, the lights will never come on. And, and manufacturers are now talking to us about light fixtures. We have one company that if you have a pendant fixture, the up light is UVC, the down light is regular light spectrum. Far UVC, is in the lower spectrum. It's not 265, it's in the 220. And what, what, what the technology people claim is that it can sanitize without harming occupants. Columbia University is testing it. Uh, there's a, uh, a, a doctor um, university in New Zealand who we've actually had on our, one of our webinars who's also testing it with, um, uh, um, with different types of, of light fixtures. And we're looking at it. We wanna see how this solution will come through. And you know we're also looking at it in bathrooms. Perhaps you know again in the bathroom you're not there very long. Uh, what if you have lighting that will have a far UV um, uh, uh, wavelength that could do some disinfection, which is a good thing to do in bathrooms anyway. So there's a lot of technologies being studied. Again, indigo clean is at 405, which is in the visible spectrum. There's different modes. You can have a white mode when people aren't. Um, aren't um, really there, and you can have the uh, disinfection mode. So there's different things that are being studied today. Okay. So you'll probably hear about these. Other technologies, we're talking about in small rooms, conference rooms, et cetera, we're, we're recommending air cleaners, uh, HEPA filter type cleaners, and we've researched a number, and this happens to be one. This is a shot from my office here where uh, this particular manufacturer uses a DFS system, which is basically a, a HEPA filter, in a V bank, but they put an electric charge across the filter bank, and they claim that it, it does attach itself. The you know these these uh, high ions do attach themselves to particles, and they get caught trapped in the filters. And they they claim it's it's good down to 0.07 micron in size. These are expensive units, but somewhat effective. Uh, other technologies: DHP, dry hydrogen peroxide. You've heard of, heard about that. MacArthur Airport on Long Island uses it. Other people have talked about it. It's a fogging system with hydrogen peroxide. The issue is hydrogen peroxide is only safe from five to 25 parts per billion in the air. And our experts on our panel are concerned that if it's not concentrated properly, it could be harmful to people. But it does, uh, this is what one technology that can disable airborne um, viruses. So sort of our summary, and again, you know, you summarize air treatment options. The question is always, what is it you're trying to, to remove? And our recommendations are always 
go to the best filter you can, a MERV 13 or 14 if you can. Ionization, we're saying, you know something, it's not really uh, something we'd recommend for viruses because it's it has not been peer reviewed. Uh, you may want to use it if you're interested in, in uh, molds and spores in the space. UV lights, again, are good, but it depends on contact time and carbon filters are really there for odor control. Let's talk about humidification. Maintaining 40 to 60% RH may limit the spread and survival of the virus. And we'll talk about that. I'll just go to the next slide. We all know that when do we get sick? We get sicker in the wintertime than we do in the summertime, and especially in, in cold climates. And the reason is, first of all, high humidity reduces the infectivity of the, the, the flu virus. So this is a chart of infectivity versus RH for the flu virus. Again, if you remember I said before that the SARS-CoV-2 mimics this. And from 10 to 30% RH, if you notice, the flu virus is very, very active. But the minute it gets to 40 to 60%, it becomes less active. Uh, they've actually used a, uh, an MS2 virus, which is, mimics the SARS virus. And they found that the half-life of the virus at 20% is three times what it is at 40%. So it lives longer. So that's factor number one. Factor number two is the membranes in the respiratory tract dry out in lower humidity. And that's our first line of defense. And many of us, many of us use a, a saline solution when we go on airplanes to make sure that we're properly, you know, that, that our, 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 uh, our respiratory tract is, is, uh, is more equipped to remove, to remove what's, what's in the air. And then the third one, which gets a lot of us nervous, is low humidity results in breathing small particles. If you remember, as you're breathing out, they start evaporating. They become buoyant, as discussed before, may become aerosolized. So that six foot may go farther than six foot. And the question is, when they become aerosolized, are they as potent <laughs> as, they, as they were as a droplet? And that's, you know, the jury is still out on that. Again, RH, uh, this is sort of a standard chart in the industry that shows that infectivity uh, reduces on viruses, bacteria, and other allergens when you get to 40 to 60% RH. So now we'll get into a little HVAC design about zoning, we took a floor in a building and we said, okay, what if you put in two air handling units, one for this side of the floor and one for that side of the floor, versus a what we call a DOAS or a VRS system, which is which is a VRF system, excuse me, which is a smaller system that it deals with smaller zones. So let's say you're in zone four. If someone's sick in zone four, the air is just recirculated in that one zone. Whereas if you're in zone four on the left, all the air goes back to the air handling unit. So each has its advantages and disadvantages. For a floor by floor unit or even a central system, the air all gets mixed, it goes back, but the air handling units can have a much better filter. You can get a MERV 13, 14, 15, probably in a floor by floor units. You also, that's a positive thing. Also, if you have a VAV system, as the cooling load reduces, you get less air, therefore less outside air or dilution in the space. If you go to a VRF or a DOAS system, you have a smaller zone, and what you can't see on the plan, but we have fresh air connection to each of these boxes, and you get an assured quantity of outside air, so the dilution is always spot on in, in the DOAS system. The downside is you can't get, or it's difficult to get, I shouldn't say you can't, a MERV-13 filter in these small units, they have very little static pressure. So all we're saying is, is both systems can be retrofitted to deal with the virus, but we just want to bring up the two that, that, that small. We're always recommending if you could get a smaller zone, just logic says I'm better off with a smaller zone than for, for transmission. So now we'll talk about the, the uh, infamous study from Guangzhou, China. Many of you have probably seen these diagrams. Some of you haven't, and I'll try to simplify it. What happened, there was a January of this year, Chinese New Year luncheon in Guangzhou. This is uh, tables. These are all tables in the restaurant. It's a little floor plan. And what happened is in the blue tables, it was an individual at table TA, they call index patient. This person was pre-symptomatic and was called a super spreader, had lots of viruses coming out. 10 people on these tables got sick. No one in the green got sick. There was an outside air connection over here where my cursor is. Uh, probably just an opening in the wall or a damper. There was, uh, and they had wall-mounted uh, VRF units that just pushed the air and recirculated it. So theoretically, the outside air would come in if you had an exhaust fan to draw it across. But what they believe happened is 
the amount of outside air that, that was here was a tenth of what the code requires and what we use in the states. And I speculate there was no outside air back here. So here's sort of a, a illustration. They used tracer gases. They went in scientifically. They actually uh, uh, did it with the same uh, um, same amount of sun coming through the windows. It was a cloudy day. They wanted to simulate the exact conditions that they could. And what they found is these units on the wall were blowing air. And what happened was the flow and direction of the air was such that it just kept pushing the air from the sick person and recirculating. And what they discovered is it was a very high concentration of the virus in this area. So everybody seemed to get sick. So they remember that we're getting sick not just from droplets, but from the aerosols that were in the air. And no one in this zone got sick, yet they found through their tracer gas tests and the CFD modeling that there were viruses over here. So I think what is the takeaway? Number one, always have good dilution. Number two, try to get the best filter you can. And number three, keep the zones. I mean, the positive thing was only people, the only people that got sick were, were in the zone. And then we talk about how much time they were together. And they said the exposure time for these blue tables was 50 minutes and 75 minutes. So they were there for an hour. And I didn't get the, the data for the, these two tables, but I suspect they were also there for quite a long time. Again, so a takeaway, something to think about. So now we'll talk a little bit about touchless technologies. What do we do architecturally to make our spaces safer? So we'll talk about doors and entryways, pantries, bathrooms, and automated lighting. So what we like to think about is, you know, all of us hopefully are either at home or in an office, and I, I'll say we're, I'm in a green zone. Green meaning I feel very safe where I am. And what all we can do as industry professionals is control or influence what happens in the buildings. The transportation from your home to your office or to wherever you're going, to, going to, to go to is really a function of whether you have a car or is it mass transportation. But we can influence the building. So it would be ideal to have automatic doors. We're talking about the journey. You come into a building, entryway mats to disinfect your shoes, a sanitation station uh, to disinfect your hands, at a security desk or reception desk, some type of barrier uh, between you and the security people. Now, for, for buildings that have elevators uh, in them, this gets a little bit dicey. How do you get through a turnstile? We would like to have some type of, of touch-free system, whether it's through an app, which I always like, or facial recognition. There's ways to do it today. And of course, increasing the outside air, improving the environment in the space. Now you're in an elevator lobby, and we, we've all been in elevators, uh, and we know that we, we limit the people in the elevators. And we're saying, in addition to the, you know, sort of limiting the number of people, consider UV or even HEPA filters in elevator cabs. Otis and other companies have come to us with a number of products that they were recommending to put in the elevators. Again, the doors open quite a bit. Um, it's unlikely you're going to get sick in an elevator with somebody who's sick if you're, if you're wearing a mask or if you, you know, unless you're there for a long period of time. But you, you need to be vigilant. Once you get into the elevator lobby, we don't want to touch a bus a button, touchless destination dispatch via a card or maybe a mobile app. And simple things that we think we can do. When the elevators are idle, when they're sitting at a floor, keep the doors open. Because if someone had been sick and sneezed or coughed and left and that door stays closed, those particles will stay, will stay in, that, in that elevator. So now we've gone up to our office floor. And what are the things we might want to consider? Of course, larger or separated workstations, staggering hours, increasing the air, you know, again, better air quality in the space. For conference rooms, spacing out seating. I mentioned perhaps adding CO2 sensors and consider portable air filtration. We're considering that for a couple of reasons. Smaller rooms don't necessarily have the air circulation. And if you get a, uh, an air cleaner, a hepatite filter that's sized at a minimum of four air changes per hour, it can do a good job in removing what's in the air. Also, psychologically, it makes people feel better. Uh, collaborative touchdown spaces are really a thing of the past for now. Of course, floor markers for circulation, again, six foot separations, and desk dividers. Our office, we actually put desk, desk dividers in. Uh, we put clear ones in, in our office so people can see each other, but the, they can take their masks off at their desk. Now you want to go to the pantry, get some coffee, hand washing, hand washing, education. That's what's very important. Uh, we're recommending that the automatic faucets be set with a 20 second timer. You can retrofit them online, most of the manufacturers. Great thing to do. Water runs for 20 seconds, 
people are encouraged to, to wash their hands or wash whatever they're using properly. App-based coffee and water machines, which they do make. Touchless cabinets, maybe you have a foot pedal to open a cabinet. And touchless countertop cutouts for recycling. So now we'll go to the bathroom. Okay, without our coffee, we have to go to the bathroom. Increasing bathroom exhaust, again, better ventilation. Uh, in a newer building, we are considering full height partitions and with, with good ventilation in them. Automatic closing lids, uh, we've looked at UV disinfection, very hard to find in the US, but certainly lids on, on toilets are very important. Automatic flushometers, and we're studying after hours UV disinfection, either if we find that the far UVC is, is not gonna be harmful, we can keep those on, or standard UVC at 265 nanometers, which would, which would um, uh, only go on when people aren't there through an occupancy sensor. Again, motion, uh, motion activated uh, for 20 seconds for, for washing your hands, an automatic paper towel dispenser, an open trash can located by the door, disable air dryers. Air dryers are just gonna move the virus around. And of course, when you leave the bathroom, an automatic bathroom door or a foot pole. We, we put foot poles in our office, which is a little plate that you just use your foot to open the door. Lead and well, many of you are familiar with lead, which encourages you know, optimal energy use in buildings and, and uh, uh, maximizing resources that you have to not waste resources. And lead, a lot of the buildings uh, do have, you can get points for out, additional outside air, uh, better filters, et cetera. So something you should look at in any of the facilities that you're in. If you have lead, find out what points were taken, because this is important for people in the buildings. And of course, well is a newer certification, which really does encourage and, and, and promotes the health of people in buildings and safety. So now we've talked about how to, you know, what the virus is itself, how we deal with it from an HVAC standpoint, architectural standpoint. Now, everything we can do is great, but if the building operation staff is not watching it and maintaining it, we haven't accomplished what we want to accomplish. So we're talking about cleaning, more regular deep cleaning, especially common touch points. We've also found, we've seen studies from some, some hotel chains that wiping down touch points with soap and water or some type of EPA, you know, disinfected is more effective than fogging it or other systems and you do that on a regular basis. Um, duck work and unit cleaning for buildings that have been sort of sitting idle for six months if there are any we want to get in and clean the units out. Changing filters, monitoring air quality, extending the hours of operation I mentioned two hours before and two hours after. Screening protocols when you come in the building are they going to be taking temperatures of people? Are you staggering hours of arrival and departure and packages? Everybody was flipped out I'll use that term in March about touching surfaces. Now people are less concerned. It's still good to, to be vigilant and keep surfaces clean and wash your hands. And are we going to allow packages to come in the buildings? You know, there's, there has to be an approach. What we think, feel very strongly about is commissioning of systems. So it doesn't matter what it says in the drawings. It matters what's happening in reality. So you have to make sure. We, we've gone to a number of buildings. We have, we've gone to buildings, the outside air dampers. This was last week. Uh, uh, the, the outside air dampers were actually locked shut. They had never been opened. I mean, you need to check these things. Creating operation and maintenance manuals for staff to check things. And then for occupants, best practice manual. If, if you occupy a space in the building, you wanna make sure everybody else that's not your organization uh, operates by the same rules. Other cleaning strategies, deep cleaning. I mentioned you can do fogging in very large spaces where you can't hit all the touch points. Uh, flushing. Building pipes, uh, you may have your pantries have not been used for six months. Run the water, make sure they're clean. You don't wanna cause other problems. If there are floor drains in bathrooms, prime them because you can get sewer gases in. I mentioned elevator cab, UV sterilization. Consider talking to your elevator vendor about what systems they may have available. I mentioned sterilization packages, additional sanitation stations um, uh, in the building. And lease terms, if you lease space, get additional cleaning in there, especially for common areas. Thermal scanning. Uh, we, we have done a lot of facial recognition, our company has, and uh, we have not done thermal scanning, but it is available. And you can get mask scanning and face scanning, uh, and you can also get thermal scanning, and they're relatively accurate today if you get the right piece of equipment. Again, it doesn't do, do you any good if you're pre-symptomatic and don't have a fever, but it will catch people that just are getting sick. Uh, thermal scanning called large volume scanning. You'll see this at airports internationally. I saw this, I mentioned earlier on when I was going to China in 2005, 
uh, going through the airports, they have thermal scanners during the SARS uh, outbreak. And uh, you can do, uh, some building owners are putting in these cameras. These are very accurate cameras that are being put in buildings. So now we'll talk about smart building workplace management. Can you manage through software and can you control or, or monitor uh, um, uh, social distancing through contact tracing? So this first uh, app above, this is um, the cell phone of Edwin Lee, who runs our office in Shanghai. And Edwin said in Shanghai, again, the government is a little, uh, uh, controls a little bit more than our government does. Uh, he said that when he flew back from Los Angeles, the, his app turned yellow or red, actually it was yellow, and he couldn't go into his office building or his, well, his apartment building because you had to show that you had been quarantined. And after 14 days, it, it turned back to green. Uh, in Australia, our Australian partner, Stuart, said there's something called COVID Safe. It's a voluntary program on your phone. You could do it with um, uh, Wi-Fi or you could do it with Bluetooth. Again, a contact tracing, uh, it only works well if people are interested in joining the program. So that would mean if you're at a place for a long period of time within a certain distance of someone who's sick, once they report it, you'll get an alert. Again, lots of biometrics or things that we're going to be talking about in the future for contact tracing, but that can be done. It's a matter of getting, getting the community to agree to it. And again, social behavior. So everything we've talked about so far also needs to influence good social behavior through through information. Social distancing, lots of education, going digital where we can, and of course, new protocols of wearing face masks, keeping your desk clean, and communication. So what we've done is, I just want to give you a summary, and certainly there's a lot to cover, of, of sort of where we see the industry. And I'll just go through briefly just to cover them again. Uh, the first column is what the current standards are, and then the second column are things that we would say you should think about and consider and with, with general comments. So outside air quantity, about increasing the air quantities in buildings. Air filtration, uh, you know, it could be 13 or eight. Let's go to a 14 if we can. And certainly 13 is what ASHRAE recommends. Air treatment systems, we're saying, hey, you can consider some of these technologies, UV lights, humidification, operable windows, if you have them, they're great. Recirculation zone size, extending hours of operation, mentioned disabling demand control ventilation, lobbies and public spaces where people are increase the outside air ventilation. I, I talked about bathrooms before, package rooms, frictionless entry where you can use an app to get in, you don't have to touch your card to a, to a turnstile. Thermal scanning is a possibility, commissioning, which is critical. Elevators, we talked about separation of building occupants and services. We didn't talk about that. What happens when the Xerox person comes up to work in the Xerox machine? Is that person going to have the same protocols to say, have you, uh, have you been exposed to anybody? Are they going to have, uh, be, be scrutinized the same way your, your employees will? Will visitors be allowed up to tenant floors? Limiting visitors' access. I mentioned entryway mats, BMS monitoring, uh, your, your control system, continuous cleaning of public spaces, special filtration we talked about for lounges or, or, or conference rooms. And that's, uh, that's the presentation for today. Uh, I hope that was helpful and useful, and I guess we'll open it to questions or. Doug, this is Jay Manick, uh, the moderator. Thank you for a fantastic presentation. We do have a number of questions, and uh, I'll go ahead and relay those and um, let you expand on it. Uh, from Suresh, uh, he, he asks, what is the MER rating of the HEPA filtration used by your standard airline? And uh, he are airlines limited by how much outside fresh air they can allow due to cabin issues? And how does that relate to the facility world? Great question. And I am not an airline expert, but I will tell you what I've learned. Number one, airline air conditioning systems are way ahead of commercial building systems because A, cost is no object. B, they have to be miniaturized. Okay. C, they do all have HEPA filters. Um, which are probably in the range of, of 16 or 17. Uh, they have a lot of good air circulation. The issue they have, frankly, is, uh, I remember on an airplane, the first time I was, uh, I was talking about it, they, they got very stuffy and the pilot to save gas would reduce the outside air. And thinking, why are they doing that? Well, when you're up in the ozone, you can't bring that air and you can't, you can't uh, breathe that. So, they take, and again, don't quote me on this, but I, uh, that they take the air off the, 
the compressed air, which is very hot off the turbines, several hundred degrees, that's the air you can breathe and has to be cooled down quite a bit, uh, so, which is why they, it, the air conditioning systems use a lot of energy on airplanes. However, what I've read about from uh, JetBlue and United is they are bringing lots of outside air, they're not cutting back, and they do have excellent filters. My recommendations to my friends who are flying is sit by the window, not by the aisle, okay? Uh, if you can get a ventilated mask, a ventilated mask, keep it on, on all the time. But airplane, um, and you could probably, if you go online, uh, you will look, uh, JetBlue has, a, or, or United have a very good video show you how they put their system together. But the, the answer is they have a much higher quality system than commercial buildings do. But again, you're sitting there in one seat for a long time. All right, thank, thanks, Doug. Uh, Chuck has a couple of questions. Uh, the first one uh, asks if you have um, a prognostication on when far UV lamps might be available at prices comparable to the UVC lamps. Great question. Um, okay, Ellie, the, the professor at the university in New Zealand is working on a, a LED lamp for the far, okay? I don't know when that's going to happen, but that will take UV to another another level, and the efficiencies will go up astronomically. Okay, so I don't have a date, but I know that they're working on that right now. Um, and actually, that's a good question for um, if, if you could send me that question. I will try to see if I can get some more information uh, in two weeks when we have our next call with our specialists, because I am interested in that as well. When that's going to happen, but again, the it's like everything else, and we hear this with the, with, the, with the vaccine. Has it been tested? Has it been peer reviewed? And the studies are doing at Columbia and still need to be peer reviewed on the effectiveness. And again, what is the effect on people? You don't wanna wait in 20 years and find out that people are getting sick. Good. Uh, a follow on um, is uh, from Chuck, is uh, complex fluid dynamics modeling being used to uh, help with strategically locating return exhaust grills. So you do capture those uh, or remove or mitigate the micro droplet. Great Thermal question. The answer is, the answer is it should be. Uh, we've looked at it for underfloor air distribution versus overhead. And for those people who are familiar with underfloor is you put or not, you put a platform floor, let's say a foot above the, let's say the concrete floor, you blow air on the floor and you have what they call swirl diffusers that induce air uh, from the space and it forms a swirl that goes vertically. So if I'm sick, I am not spreading the air to other people. So theoretically that could work very well. Overhead systems, unfortunately the way they work, and I'm actually in my office staring at the diffuser, they blow air out sideways against the wall and they cause induction. So displacement diffusers, underfloor diffusers could be very effective. Uh, again, every space is so unique. I mean, we're involved with the restaurant industry now, and as you all know, every restaurant is different, and how do you make sure that they're as safe as possible? But the, the, I, I, I suspect ASHRAE is going to come back with, with uh, more rules and guidelines on diffuser placement. Uh, uh, that's a great question. Uh, uh, a uh, question related to the, the cost impact. Um, relative uh, impact of the various measures that you can take to mitigate uh, the, the uh, virus spread. Any uh, insights on that? Great question. The, the most effective thing you can do with the lowest cost is put a better filter on the unit. And what we're finding is, and we're looking at installations all over the place today, all over the country, uh, is, the effect of putting a better filter, filters, remember from the earlier slide, there's, you know, there's a lot more contact of the air with a filter than it is with, a, with, um, uh, with, with diluting the air. So ASHRAE strongly recommends better filters. Uh, there's a very small increase in energy, perhaps, if you have a higher, um, the filter has a higher pressure drop, so the fan has to work a little harder. The workaround could be you change the filter more often rather than changing every Four months, you change it every two months. That is the most cost-effective way to, to uh, mitigate. Uh, UV, ionization, they're expensive. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll throw out numbers, but um, it could be in the range of a dollar a square foot. 
So if you have a 20,000 square foot floor, it could cost you $20,000 or more. I mean, it depends on how you're applying it. And you know, UV is, you can't find UV today. They're very, uh, very hard to find. You can't find filters today. Uh, but I always, I always talk about, let's take the easiest steps first, bring in more outside air, better filtration. Those are the two keys. Good. That, that answered a number of questions. Um, a related question on UV lamps are, uh, is there, is there uh, eye damage risk, vision uh, damage risk with UVC lamps? The answer is yes, but we're only recommending them within air handling units themselves with a safety shutoff or upper room UV. If you do upper room UV where the light shines up, you have to carefully select the materials to make sure there's no reflection down into the space. Uh, what we've been told is UVC, if you are exposed to it, can cause some headaches, um, uh, uh, you know, an un an uncomfortable um, you know, lighting. But again, it's about the intensity of the lamps. You can buy, it's a 10 watt, you know, you see these, uh, you know, on my, since I research this all the time, every time I'm on, my, I'm on my phone, I get another advertisement. If you get a small 10 watt bulb, unless you stick it, you know, and you're staring at it, it's really not going to hurt you. But the ones we're using in HVAC systems have much higher output. So the answer is stay, you know, stay away from them. And when you think about UV, think about the sun, UVB. You know, UVB, you can get sunburn. And if you're exposed to that sun for many, many years, obviously uh, people get skin cancer. So yes, UVC is not something to be taken lightly. And then a uh, question regarding building codes and standards and potential revisions to consider COVID-19 and, and other uh, mitigation efforts. Any trends you see in that area? We will know shortly, and the answer is yes. So uh, Dr. Bonflecht, who is, I said, the, the chair of the, the COVID-19 committee, uh, is talking to us about what, you know, what can, changes that ASHRAE is going to consider. Um, to date, in terms of outside air, outside air is really the amount of outside air they bring in is related to what you're trying to, uh, it, it pollutants in the air and CO2, nothing to do with viral. And the question is, are they going to increase the amount of outside air in buildings? And if they do, there's an energy implication. So ASHRAE to date is really, the, there's the Wells-Riley uh, equation, which many of you may know. Uh, they are, I don't want to use the word promoting, they're saying the science is saying better filtration, lower cost, better return than diluting outside air because they, they feel that by filtering, you're going to remove enough viruses that more air is not necessarily going to be that helpful. So I see more on the filtration side right now, but we'll, time will tell and we'll see what they what they come up with. But again, what ASHRAE does, and you know, I'm very, I'm, I've been a member of ASHRAE my whole career, but this is the first time I really got this deep with them. They want to base everything on science. And and that's understandable, but you're uh, I, I appreciate the uh, the tiering of the suggestions, uh, suggested um, strategies. Now I, we have a question regarding uh, touchless devices in restrooms, uh, other places. Uh, some folks say that um, the O and M staff is reluctant to install those because of uh, maintenance costs or maintenance concerns. From your perspective, is that valid? Can, I've never heard that, and we've been using uh, 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 touchless faucets, journals, uh, water closets for 25 years. I've never heard that. Now, you, they have battery type, and the batteries need to be changed like every two years, and you have a, a 110 volt, you know, you can, or, 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 or a low voltage units. I've never heard of that as an issue. He may have an especially cranky O and M staff. Yeah, yeah, could be. <laughs> I don't know. I would think the opposite. They want they want more work for themselves if they thought maybe, it was maybe. So <laughs> maybe keep their jobs if they think it's worse. Uh, Doug, I think we're coming up on the close of the hour. Uh, again, we had over 190 attendees today, so uh, a big round of applause to you virtually, and thank you to uh, SAME, the Resilience Committee, uh, Community of Interest. I'm sorry, uh, to Tamel Harbison for uh, being our our overall uh, person in charge of the technology. And thanks to everybody for uh, being on the call today. The handouts are available. And Tamel, I'll turn it over to you if you have any uh, closing thoughts. Again, thank you, Doug. Yeah, just this, this is Doug, just one, one closing. 
Mark, if anybody has questions, my email is up there. Please feel free to, to email me. You know, this is, I learn as much as I talk about on presentations and the questions that I get from people. And I say, you know, I never thought of that. So please feel free, even if you think it's just a stupid question, if I can answer it, I'd be happy to. Uh, thank you again, Doug, uh, for an excellent presentation as well, informative. And thank you, Jay, for uh, moderating today's session. Um, just one quick last thing. Uh, we do have the 2020 Small Business Conference, which will be virtual. It will be held November 4th to 6th. And you can find out all those details at samesbc.org. You can just take a visit over to that website. And I believe registration will be open September 1st. So go over there, check it out, see what you can get from the uh, upcoming conference. Again, thank you all for joining today's session and uh, the presentation will be posted on the Resilience Community of Interest webpage at SAME.org. So go over there and check it out later this week. Um, and enjoy the rest of your day. Have a good one, everyone. Thank you.